This is the Human Action Podcast, where we debunk the economic, political, and even cultural myths of the days. Here's your host, Dr. Bob Murphy. Connor, welcome to the Human Action Podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me, Bob. Now, folks, before we dive into Connor's article at Mises.org that talks about the campus protest, which is going to be the meat of this episode, let me mention Connor and I will both be at the Mises Institute uh, for an upcoming event. It's going to actually go from May 16th through the 18th. There's a reception on the evening of the 16th, and then there's a full-blown conference with a lot of different speakers, including myself, on the uh, latter two days. And it has to do with the uh, significance of human action. So we're all going to be giving quick talks on uh, specific aspects of human action. And you can go, if you go to the website, you can see in the event page, yeah, it's got the, the actual topics listed if you're curious. Uh, it's just from many of the senior fellows, uh, other fellows, associated scholars are going to deliver presentations on the significance of that classic magnum opus from Mises. And then the special treat is returning to his intellectual home for the first time since COVID, Dr. Hans Hermann Hoppe will deliver the keynote lecture. Okay, and so we invite you to go ahead and, and check that out if you're interested. If you go to the event tab at Mises.org, you can go find all the details. So, Connor, as I said, the focus for today's episode is going to be your recent article. So maybe I'll just stop and let you uh, give a big picture of what you cover in the article, and then we'll dive into some of the details. Yeah, so um, I write I write a weekly article on the Mises Wire, and I try to uh, you know depending on what's on what's in the news, um, I attempt to sort of take whatever the big story is that everybody's arguing about and kind of reframe it in kind of Austrian or Austro libertarian mm -hmm. uh, ways. And so by far the biggest uh, story this week, at least when I was looking for topics, were, were these campus protests. But um, I was a little frustrated because it was like I felt like there were so many factors um, that uh, I, I was not, there was no obvious like single conclusion um, to me. And so I decided to kind of lean into that. And I ended up just writing an article that kind of went piece by piece with some of the things I was thinking about, some of my reactions, some of the things I liked about these protests, some of the things that I didn't like, um, and same thing with the reaction to them. So um, I ended up writing you know, an article without one single point, but actually like, I don't know, maybe four or five Mm -hmm. uh, points and kind of took them step by step. So I um, start off by saying, like, I, I generally, I support the cause that these protests um, have, you know, broken out about. Uh, well, okay, I, uh, sorry, Connor, let me just yeah, stop yeah, you for a second, just for the listener. So that the title, I don't know if you picked it or they just gave it to you, but was what the campus protesters and their critics get right and wrong. And that's actually why I was attracted to this, Connor, because I'm I was sort of in the same boat you are where it looked like the, the reactions I was seeing on Twitter, which is where I spend most of my non-productive hours of the day, is uh, that people were just focusing on one thing. And like, I could understand yet where they were coming from, but yet it seemed like they were leaving out a lot. And like, yeah, mm -hmm. if that's the only thing you're taking away from this, you're kind of missing some other important, you know, context or whatever you want to call it. So that's why I was glad to see that. Yeah, you, it, and that's why I wanted to have you on. Cause I, I think you're right that it's, it's not just, Hey, do you support the protesters? Yes or no. It's way more complicated than that. Yeah, it's way more complicated. Yeah, and you're right. There was a lot of um, uh, people were focusing on the micro, of like specific aspects of it, and there was not a lot of nuance in how people were characterizing these protests. And um, so, uh, yeah, I was kind of going back and forth. Like I, I said, I, um, I generally support the the cause. I agree that like I, I want the U.S. to stop funding what's happening in Gaza right now. But on top of that, there are uh, these. Protesters are not a homogenous unit. There are um, certainly students involved that um, are very, you know, focused on that cause and are clearly thinking about how they want to present themselves and how they want to present this protest movement. But then there are other students um, or some people that might not be students who um, are uh, either they're not um, as focused on kind of like being effective um, or they're just not even really sure why everybody's out there. Um, and so I, I kind of went through and sort of uh, tried to analyze all these different um, components of uh, the protest and sort of speak to what I thought they were doing right and what I thought they were doing wrong. And then also the reaction. The reaction has been um, kind of predictable, but also 
Um, it's also lacking in nuance as well. So um, I, I have seen a lot of right wingers kind of, you know, the, 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 crit the criticisms you'd expect from these types, you know, when college students uh, tend to protest like this, most of which I agree with. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not a fan of the universities <laughs> in mm -hmm. their current form. And um, so I was kind of speaking to uh, what I saw were some good criticisms and, you know, there are calls to defund the universities, which I think is fantastic. I think we should have done that a long time ago, and I'm completely on board with that. Um, but then there are issues there, too. Like, I think a lot of right-wingers, especially, um, is, you know, fervent Israel supporters are really trying to put, you know, put across this narrative that these mobs of students are just like, they're just seething with hatred for Jews, and that is like the only thing motivating them. And yep. Uh, first, I think that's just easily disproven if you look at what's happening. Um, not, not that there's none of that. There's certainly some of that. But um, so I was also criticizing that aspect because I think, you know, where I agree and I, I want like, yeah, like defund these students, uh, the, defund the universities. I'm all on board with that. I think trying to push a narrative that you might prefer, but that isn't really, you know, it's not really based in reality just hurts that effort, too. So I had plenty of criticisms for both sides. And uh, just kind of wanted to work it all out. And so this article was me working out my thoughts. Well, great. Yeah. And it's I think it is nuanced and complex. And I know that some people don't like that. You're like, oh, take a side. You know, you're trying to write. And no, I'm not, I mean, for me personally, I don't want to put words in your mouth. I'm not trying to like ride the fence or avoid offending somebody. It's just it's like you're saying, there's lots of stuff going on. I think we can dive into this and give some more specifics here. But, you know, you kind of started out in your article just to circle back with, you know, like, what is it that people are caring about here? Like, so, of course, there was the horrific attack on October 7th, and there's disputes about, and I was, you know, reading some of the, you know, you had some links, and then I was independently going to look up some things, and it's, people quit argue about the numbers, and there's some even claims that maybe some of the people, some of the Israelis who died that day, it was from so-called friendly fire, Mm -hmm. You know, with the you know aggressive response once the Israeli military got on board, and I know there's lots of claims about there were uh, is Israeli military. Well, I don't know if they're military, but like the, the mechanism that the uh, Israeli defense forces had in place to monitor Gaza and say you know give a heads up, like hey they're they're cooking up something over there, and that a lot, there's reports coming out that yeah for months a lot of those uh, outlook you know, you know, people were warning and they, their warnings were dismissed and things, you know, so there seemed to be, have been a, a big intelligence failure at the very least. Uh, but roughly speaking, I mean, does this line up with your, I was seeing that estimates that like 1200 people, maybe, you know, so civilians, Israeli civilians died that day. And, yeah, you know, I, I 240 so 1200 is the agreed upon number, but I think that includes military. Oh, well, sorry. So yeah. Civilian. I shouldn't have said it's just that Israelis just period. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, and then, so then your article, like to give people a sense of, you know, those who are saying, uh, you know, we're not supporting Hamas, but this response is way out of proportion that, you know, there, you hit quoted a figure. What was it? 31,000? 34. Remember? I Thir sorry. 34,000. 35. Yeah. And, and then, and you even had a link saying that that's, they're at least according to some news reports, the Israeli military is, is, you know, saying like, yeah, that it could be reliable. You know, they're not like endorsing the number because they're part of the issue is they're not going and trying to verify. Like if they go bomb a certain place, they don't go counting bodies necessarily depending on the target. But that, you know, you l at least link to one article that was quoting certain Israeli military sources that, mm, yeah, that, that might be right. That in other words, like that's not a crazy number for them to be throwing out to say 34,000 Gazans have been killed since mm -hmm. these operations began. So just on the face of it, just again, kind of showing, you know, and it's certainly in many of those Gazan casualties are children. So whatever you think about, you know, that's certainly, they were not directly responsible. They weren't even alive when, if you want to say, well, people voted for Hamas, some of them, you know, they didn't vote for them. So anyway, it's just one example of the context of what is the kind of thing we're, we're talking about here. And I know I've seen some people are sharing videos of, and I'm not trying to be inflammatory here, but like babies with limbs blown off and saying, oh, but tell me about how some uh, Jewish kid on an Ivy League campus couldn't go to class yesterday. You know, I'd like to try to say, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, we can talk about the pro, but really if you're more concerned about 
and I've even people heard, hear people put it this way, if the thing that's really bothering you is campus protesters about a war, but not what's going on, and even some people don't even want to call it a war because that makes it sound like there's two mm-hmm. sides with military equipment, then, you know, something's out of whack with your priorities. Right. So something else you brought that I that mm-hmm. was not on my radar, maybe you can expound on this, is you were like, I think some of us were kind of just, this thing started just happening and then all of a sudden it was a big deal. And you say the current spate of protests can be drawn back to April 17th when the president of Columbia University was brought before Congress to testify about anti-Semitism at the school. At the same time, about 100 Columbia students set up a Gaza solidarity tent. And then you start talking about how they got expelled even though, or... Do you want to talk about, you know, I'm talking, you, you said something yeah. like the president said something that was just not true. So uh, my understanding, and I, um, uh, this is based on like a few articles I've written. I haven't taken a mm-hmm. deep dive, but my understanding of specifically why this all blew up um, in, you know, two weeks ago was because while she was, while this, the president was testifying, um, she was basically hauled in front of Congress to ask, ask, they were asking her about the safety of Jews on campus. And some students, uh, Columbia has like a quad or like a, you know, green space. They set up an encampment there. Mm-hmm. Um, but then the day after, so April 18th, um, the uh, president of Columbia asked the NYPD to come in and arrest those students. And I guess it was um, it was like declared or part of the the request was they they said that these students were suspended, which, as I understand it, was not actually true at the mm-hmm. time. So they come in, they arrest 108, I believe, 108 students. And there's a big reaction. Other students come out and they're like, what the heck is this? And so I believe it was after the arrest, the school went back and used the arrest as an excuse to actually suspend these students. But regardless of the, the specifics, they, they arrested 108 students, and uh, the place just exploded. And on top of that, um, these encampments and protests started at other schools. So it was, in terms of trying to calm down the situation, it could not have gone worse. It completely backfired. And um, it, to the best of my understanding, that is the specific reason why um, there's a big wave of it all of a sudden. Mm-hmm. Right now. Okay. Res- responding to the, the crackdown? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Well, it, it was the, yeah, the, the arrests kind of got everybody upset and okay, then you know okay. these things like just kind of build right so you're so. you're i mean again we know you don't have a crystal ball and you don't know but you're saying you you think it's entirely plausible to say the reason all of a sudden i mean in other words this stuff you know the the idf response has been happening since october 8th mm-hmm. and so why is it all of a sudden that this is such a huge deal whereas it wasn't and when i say this i mean you know protesting mm-hmm. and counter protesting occurring on u.s campuses, particularly like in fairly elite schools, um, why is it such a big deal lately? And, you, and you're saying it might be because the university called in the, the NYPD to clear these people out, and then that's what sparked and, and made it, whereas if they had just kind of let them sit there and, okay, yeah, you've got your pet cause, and we get it, and yeah, anti-war, okay, and it kind of ignored them that maybe it would not have blossomed like it did? Yeah, that, that, that seems right to me. I think it's like when things like this happen, there's um, there's a lot of underlying factors that have to be in place, but then there's usually that spark, the thing that kind of, um, you know, leads everything to explode. So uh, it, it makes a lot of sense to me. And the timing just works out that that it's that crackdown that really uh, started this all. Because you're right, like the, the Israeli response has been going on for months now, um, but, you know, it's every day. Mm-hmm. And the, the, it, I think there there has to be some specific thing that is like drives everybody out that afternoon to really uh, get the ball rolling, you know, th- to the scale mm-hmm. that we're seeing it yeah. today. Okay. And again, I'm, I think I'm just going to walk through your article here, Connor, because sure. it's, it is like you're saying, it's, it's not, you can't just say, oh, my thesis is and state right. it in one sentence because it's just, there's lots of different things going on and what can you do except note them all and to get a coherent picture. So for example, well, to take a step back. So the first thing is to say, in your book and mine too, it is entirely plausible or reasonable for a bunch of idealistic college students to say, well, you know, one thing is, wh- why are they protesting uh, in the U.S.? Like, what does the U.S. have to do with it? And the obvious answer is, well, because the U.S. is helping to fund this. Right. And right. so, you know, like, if you're against what the Israeli response is, then at the very least, you know, you don't want your government funding it and then also providing sort of diplomatic or cover in the in the global community as it were where you know if, if if the u.s came out and harshly condemned it then you know presumably israel wouldn't be able to act with such a 
uh, reckless abandon in our view. Or even just – it doesn't have to be a condemnation, but just to not fund it, to not send yeah. all their weapons. It's like we're, we're really the ones propping – them up so yeah it, it makes complete sense for the, the, the americans are very much involved um in mm -hmm. this even though it's not directly american people over there mm -hmm. okay and so then another line of like so from coming from so there you've sort of said oh so you know the the basic premise of what they're doing that makes sense i could get i'm gonna get behind that or at least not think but then the cynics i've seen the the people who are critics of these protesters will say things like are you kidding me if people we I've seen videos people going up and asking them basic facts about what are you complaining about what do you want and they you know they're a bunch of idiots they don't know anything there's 20 year old snot nosed kids you know brats spoiled brats and they don't know anything and and you talk about that in your article yeah I, I just want to make that as an aside like I th there was specifically a video of uh, two young women students um, I I think they might have been at Columbia or NYU but they were like going back and forth between the two. Um, and somebody went up to them with a camera and was like, what are you protesting for? And they like kind of give like a one word answer. And then they ask for like clarification and they just fall apart. They have no real idea. Mm -hmm. And, um, the, the point, I just wanted to make the point that like, that is not something that's unique to this protest movement or, um, to any real political movement, um, especially any big political movement. Um, I, I just, I think that's an important thing to keep in mind, especially for those of us who are like, obsessed with politics and like read the news a lot and can follow this stuff uh and you know listen to hour-long podcasts about this stuff um it's important to remember that most people are not choosing their political beliefs based on like you know argument and logic it, for most people uh it's essentially a social calculation like i like to think of it that like most people choose their political beliefs in the same way that like high schoolers choose their shoes. It's like about what everybody else is doing around them. Maybe they want to be, some people want to fit in, some people want to be more rebellious, but usually um, people are looking to those next to them to sort of calculate what they're going to be saying here. And so I, I, that's especially true in my experience on a college campus. Mm -hmm. And um, so when you see big, you know, protests or demonstrations like this happening, most people are there probably not because they sat down and read a book about the, you know, the the history of Gaza or whatever. They're they're there because all their friends are there, or, or you know, more dramatically on these campuses because um, it's almost suspicious if you're not kind of on board with the the campus mm -hmm. orthodoxy. And um, so I I was just sort of trying to preempt that attack that like unlike any other protest movement, there are people here that don't understand. It's like, no, this is, this is normal that, you know, people are, people are there because it's almost more like a fashion statement than a, you know, logical political belief. So I was just kind of trying to quickly address that. This isn't unique to, to these mm -hmm. protests. Okay. And then I suppose to go the other way that, you know, the, the cynic, the 50 year old hard boiled person who thinks these are all a bunch of, you know, spoiled kids who should go get a job would say, yeah, you're right. I think all these campus protesters are always stupid. You know, whether they're, you know, complaining about Mother Earth or systematic racism or the oppression of the people, you know, defending the Hamas murderers. So you guys are sort of agreeing that, you know, and I guess your point is, well, just because there are a lot of people who latch onto a movement doesn't mean the movement is illegitimate. Yeah, that's that's in fact normal. And yeah, it's mm -hmm. the same kind of thing for the people that are, you know, the critics have a lot of people that are also critical of this because of the people they're around or how they kind of identify and want to be identified to other people. That's just like, that's, that's human nature. That's kind of, that's how we are. Um, yeah. And I, I think it's import, important to remember that uh, when we're trying to like analyze movements like this. Okay. Um, and And you do say that, you know, some students you did recognize they're you, I'll just quote you. Some student protesters are clearly serious about staging effective demonstrations, avoiding unnecessarily divisive chants and slogans that do nothing but close the minds of people not already reached. And they encouraged and even participated when Jewish protesters broke for Seder in the encampments on the first night of Passover to help counter the ridiculous assertion that opposition to what Israel is currently doing in Gaza always stems from a hatred of Jews. So do you want to, I mean, it's pretty self-explanatory, but do you want to expound on that? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, my big uh, – when it came, comes to my uh, – the, the critiques I had of the protesters, my problems 
with the protesters. Most of it is essentially strategic. And um, so I was making a nod to like, I think that, you know, there are some there. And yeah, I, I use that terminology. They're serious. But what I mean is they're, they're thinking about um, how do we actually use these demonstrations to try to get closer to our goals, whether that be, you know, the big goal is for the U.S. to stop uh, just sending a blank check over mm -hmm. there. But uh, a lot of these um, encampments and protests are more specifically focused on their own schools. They want their schools to divest um, from, it, uh, for a lot of it, it's um, divesting. I, it was more targeted than I expected, but from like military companies so, or defense contractors uh, like Lockheed Martin, but then oh, okay, I actually few. hadn't. Yeah, can you ex talk about? The, so yeah, I think some people don't know, or I'm sure a lot of people don't know that specific. So can you explain that, that it's not just, hey, we're Marxists and we don't like capitalism and racism and Europeans. Like, no, they actually some of their specific demands are kind of reasonable given what their yeah, ostensible. They're, they're better than is. I was expecting, I guess is, is how I'd say it. I, I and you know, usually the in an article they'll just say they're trying to divest from Israel. That's not very specific. Mm -hmm. um, I expected it to be like divest from, uh, divest from companies that do business in Israel, which is like that's probably a lot of them. And and mm -hmm. then I was sort of expecting that kind of you know the Marxist uh, right. kind of flavor to it, like you were just saying. But and I'm sure there's some of that. There's a lot of schools that are you know experiencing protests right now. So I'm sure that if you dig enough, you could find some ridiculous demands. There's probably plenty. Um, but I was pleasantly surprised with um, at least some of the the bigger protests, the more newsworthy demonstrations. They they were a bit more targeted. They a, a lot talking about defense contractors and like going after Lockheed Martin. They you know they didn't want their school to be invested in Lockheed Martin, which is great to me. That sounds mm -hmm. fantastic. Um, and then you know there there were some like I, I think Google was another one because Google has some big contracts with the Israeli government. Um, but uh, that that's a, a core demand of. Um, the the demonstrations we're seeing right now is I, I guess the thinking um, is if they can't get you know Washington to stop sending support over at least they can mm -hmm. focus on their school which I think is kind of a reasonable next yeah. step. Okay. Yes, and I mean again that does because that, that that was like I say one of the things I had seen was people rolling their eyes like what you're talking about some conflict that's happening across the ocean. What do you guys care? What you know going to protest the Columbia? Okay. But if they're saying, well, no, we don't want our endowment invested in companies that are sending weapons over there that are being used to kill babies, that's not prima facie a ludicrous thing to complain about. <laughs> to to yeah. say, at the very least, you know, the people running Colombia can decide not to, you know, directly contribute to that. So, right. okay. Right. So, so and so um, just to kind of circle back to my answer. So th those are sort of what they're... Um, the 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 purpose of these demonstrations that that's their goals, mm -hmm. but at the same time, it's kind of like we just you know we live in the age where like the information age, so everything is kind of at least everything in politics is kind of an information war in a lot of ways. It's mm -hmm. a battle of narratives, and so um, the the they're also kind of trying to brand themselves, and I I just think that um, if they are serious about um, you know helping to you know raise awareness about what's happening over there and to kind of um, when on the ideas front, then I think that uh, the the correct way to do that is to try to speak to the unconverted, to the people that are maybe just sort of ambivalent about this, or maybe who aren't really on the same side, maybe people who so far have seen no problem at all with um, what Israel is doing in response to October 7th. And um, th the way to do that is not to lean in to all the, you know, all the things that everybody's upset about, but to be very, you know, smart and measured and kind of like persuasion is, um, is a gentle process. It's about kind of, um, injecting doubt gently and showing people that like, um, you know, you don't need to give up your identity. You can still consider yourself a good person if you change your mind on mm -hmm. this one thing. And like, for instance, for, I, I think, um, it's important to point out, and I wish more people like in the process would be pointing out that you don't need to like go all the way to saying like, oh, it, we need to you know, go all the way back to 1948 borders and like be completely anti-Israel. You, you can be uh, pro-Israel and say, I'm, you know, I disagree with the method, which, in you know, the, the method that they chose to go after Hamas, I think, you know, I think they could have had different priorities. Um, it, it's if you, if they were, if the students were serious about um, really changing minds out there. There, mm -hmm. there are better ways to do that. And I, I think, for instance, that one, the one example of 
um, on the first night of Passover, how the, the protesters broke for Seder at a lot of um, places, and you know, all these students involved, um, you know, Jewish or not. Like, I think that that is a good uh, in terms of that, like the um, the information, the narrative battle. Um, that that is that's a smart move because you're you're really countering the the narrative that like the only reason all those students are out there is because the professors taught them to hate Jews and then they just like robots mm-hmm. go out there. Um, so that's smart. And so I, I was trying to make a nod to like that there are students that are clearly doing this right before I kind of get into what I see as uh, the, the mm-hmm. strategic mistakes that are being made. Yeah, and just to, to walk with that a little bit, it's because I know a big thing going around, and I'm curious to hear your thoughts on it too, is this claim that like, oh, there, there are these protesters are openly preventing Jewish students from entering the building, and then they show photos from the you know, 1930s Germany and people locking, or maybe from uh, Austria, I can't remember the photos I saw, and, and saying, look, at it's just like the Nazis. And so one thing that occurred to me was like, yeah, I, I had seen the, the Seder thing. I was like, well, no, that can't be literally true, because how is it that they're celebrating Passover with the Jewish members of the in camps if they're not even allowing them you know, in? That's, that's clearly not the case. And then I had seen some video, like there, you know, there's a guy who's going up, and there's some people who are holding arm. And I think the kid, if he really wanted to, could have walked through. I mean, it's like... Mm-hmm a couple 120 pound girls were holding their arms but okay fine and he's going oh i can't go to class i can't go to and so for one thing he's got a he's got his buddy camera you know with the camera Mm -hmm. and he's clearly getting in their face and you know and i saw some other context of that particular video and they were saying he could have gotten to class like they they were you know they had cordoned off their area and they weren't letting him in but he could have gone around and also I, you know, the point I was making is people said if he showed up, you know, he didn't have somebody filming it and he had a sign saying Netanyahu equals war criminal, you're saying they wouldn't have let him in because they would have said, wait a minute. And the other thing I said is, how do they know these students are Jewish? You know what I mean? Like, it's not, it's one thing like to say in the old days of segregation, if, oh, whites wouldn't let black people into a certain school, like that makes, but for this, unless the person's openly advertising with the way they're dressed or they're wearing a chain or so, you know, it's, yeah, which that's not as was, obvious. I believe. He, he, right, he, a, yeah, he was, David. but mm-hmm. uh, so, and, and I know like, so we said, Oh, so Bob, you're saying as long as they just hide their, no, obviously that's not what I'm saying, <laughs> but I'm saying this, this, this claim about, Oh, they're preventing Jewish students from entering the building. Just like the Nazi. I was, wait a minute. How, how would they know? And, and also like you're saying these other data points of, they also were celebrating Passover with some of their own comrades, you know, who may have been Marxist for all I know. So it's clear. So my point was, I think, isn't it more accurate to say people who are openly hostile to their political aims and are coming in looking to mess with them, they're saying, no, we don't want you here. Go away. But the people who support what they're doing, then they say, yeah, come on in. More, the more the merrier. We're trying to, you know, change the world here. And then, right. so if you want... Zionist versus anti-Zionist, maybe that's the way, but it certainly is not mapping one-to-one with students who are Jewish or who are not Jewish. That's clearly not what the dividing line is between who gets to pass these barriers that, and some of the videos I've seen consist of, like I say, a bunch of girls that are you know, like just locking arms. And if somebody really wanted to, I think you probably could just walk right through, but that's just right. me. Yeah, it seems like, and I've seen that same video um, and like, I, you know, I'm not a fan of that tactic. It's, I think it's kind of, especially like, I could understand if there's a big mob of counter protesters that like, okay, mm-hmm. maybe we don't want to mix everybody up here. Um, but when it's just kind of like this, this whole, like blocking people for no real reason, it just seems like, a a good way to destroy any sympathy that, you know, people that are, uh, kind of apathetic about it would have for you. And like I, th- that video, like that kid was clearly trying to demonstrate, you know, he had, his, he gave his phone to his friend to film mm-hmm. and was like mm-hmm. showing his student ID and like talking to the camera. And, you know, I, I think that's fair. Like he's showing like, you know, they, they really are not letting people through. Um, I, I haven't seen any compelling evidence that they were letting everybody through until they saw him with the star of David. Like I, I don't see any evidence that they're specifically stopping Jews from walking through. Um, and, and I think, um, I don't know, I don't remember, I, I think that might have been UCLA, but there's at least one school where um, they're like trying to set up almost like a collective or something. Like, do you remember Chaz back in 2020? Yeah. 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 yeah mm-hmm. I think there's something like that going on. I 
think that's a terrible With, like, idea. the wrist, wristbands or something? Is that what you're talking about? I don't know. I didn't see anything about wristbands. Okay, but yeah, I, think so it I was saw like, something, yeah, like within the last few days where at least at one school, and again, with all this stuff, you know, everyone's lying on both sides or taking stuff out, so it's hard to say. But yeah, I saw what's purported to be video, and then, you know, they have masks on and whatever. So yeah, this is all, I, to be clear, I don't support their particular tactics on all this stuff, but I just want to be accurate about what is it that they're doing. Right. And yeah, and they were like, they, and they had like a, uh, like a, like a barrier, like this, like things cops would set up if there was going to be a parade to keep the streets separate from the sidewalks. You know what I mean? Like that kind of a thing. Yeah. So just like a little, barrier. like, fe yeah, bear, fence uh -huh. deal or whatever that's, you know, the waist high. And they had that up in this like little alley. And then there was a guy standing there, a kid standing there, with a mask on and what, you know, he like, kind of not some hulking menace, but all right, fine. And, um, and like to get through, you know, you had to, he had to put a wrist, a, a thing on your wrist to get through or whatever. And so mm -hmm. like, oh, they're setting up checkpoints. So again, it's stupid. And they, I'm sure they have no right to do that or whatever. I'm not endorsing that, but the, yeah, that was, I did see something like that. I thought maybe that's what you were talking about, which clearly I would say that's, that's crazy. And, I don't know how I would have reacted if I was a student at the time, but I'm sure I would not have let them move me around like cattle. I think I probably would have figured out, well, if I go this way, I'll get to class yeah. and these guys are idiots, but. Yeah, it's just dumb, I think. And it's a distraction from, from the actual cause that they claim to be mm -hmm. out there for. Okay. So and so now let me read. I like this part was good too. This will be, it's going to be two paragraphs, but it's so good where you're, Really hammering the, the the protesters so that the viewer who was against these kids knows that Connor, you're not uh, their cheerleader. Playing both sides. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> their strategic ineptitude of these students can seem almost astounding until you remember what they're being taught at these schools. Universities like Columbia have gone all in on identity politics and social justice. A more accurate name would be trait-based collectivized justice. The dominant historical narrative that permeates almost every department and class curriculum considers the world to mostly have been in balance until white Western Europeans decided to get rich by stealing and expropriating resources from the rest of the world. Putting aside how economically and historically delusional that is, by framing history as a series of injustices committed by an entire identity group on other identity groups in their entirety, adherents conclude that justice can only be attained on a collective group level, and then he's the punchline, and so, when students see the horrific images and videos coming out of Gaza of mostly brown, mostly Muslim people being blown up, crushed, and starved by white-looking descendants of European immigrants, it seems to fit neatly into their learned worldview. So even though, in this case, it leads most of them to the correct general conclusion, to be opposing, you know, what the Israeli military is doing here, it shouldn't be a surprise that an imprecise, historically flawed narrative leads to imprecise, strategically flawed activism. So I just quoted you at length there, but do you want to add anything to that succinct I, statement? Yeah, that, that's, um, I, I don't know if I have too much to add. It's just, uh, I, I, it's kind of always interesting to watch things as like more of like a Rothbardian. I, I have a very different, you know, concept of justice from these students. And um, so, you know, even though, our conclusions are generally the same. We both want to cut off funding. The, the way we got there, you know, me and all these students is, is very different. And um, that certainly comes out in a lot of their behavior and rhetoric. And like, just, you know, what I was talking about earlier with like um, the, the proper strategic way to try to kind of win everybody over, um, you know, I'm saying that from my perspective as like a Rothbardian libertarian, um, they have a very different perspective. They were sort of taught a very different story about history and you know they're just and i i was i kind of came from that world i was raised in kind of blue america went to a small liberal arts college so i'm kind of generally familiar with the story and you know it's a lot of emphasis on um you know basically since world war ii it was like uh you know the civil rights movement you know the vietnam stuff like like the, it's a story where american history is guided by you know young mostly student uh, protesters rising up and demanding change. Um, and then, you know, you know, America moves forward and, you know, everything is upgraded. It's like, it, it's not, it's not a surprise if you sit in like any kind of history course, at, you know, these schools or a sociology course, it's not a surprise that the conclusion of the students is that, okay, well, if something bad is happening in the world and America's involved or something bad is happening in America, then this is what we do. We all, you know, 
go crazy and start protesting. That's like, that's the obvious conclusion from uh, sort of the, the historical myth that you're kind of um, taught. Uh, and so I just kind of wanted to, to speak to that because um, yeah, as I'm criticizing them for, you know, like mm-hmm. taking down the American flag and they're like, uh, I, that, that's the reason I think that um, uh, as much as I agree with their conclusions, um, I'm still in a very different place from, you know, the average student or participant at these protests. And so then again, in your nuanced balanced take, you, so you make those points. Okay. And then you move on to now in fairness to the students, it's a lot of the criticism coming, you know, so we can sit and criticize them for the reason you're saying, but actually, but then the people who are trumpeting and saying, look at what a bunch of Nazi loving anti-Semites these students are that really what's going on here is they've been bristling their whole lives with the, you know, waiting for their opportunity to be able to just let their anti-Semitism flow. And now they finally got their chance that, no, that that's not, yeah, there are some isolated instances where people said anti-Semitic things and you can see some signs maybe, but a lot of this stuff, when you go and look at it is not clearly. So we already talked about the claim that, oh, they're not letting Jewish students go to class when I think that's not quite right. But also you talk about, it was floating around for a while that, oh my gosh, they stabbed some, was it a girl or was it a boy? I think it was a girl, right? Yeah, in the eye? I don't remember off the top of my head. Okay. But, you know, saying they took a, somebody, a, a flagpole and stabbed somebody in the eye with it. And, oh my gosh, these <laughs> people are monsters. And you want to, you know, you I know I looked into that too, but do you want to talk about that? Yeah. Well, I mean, that was, that was one incident where, you know, it, it's sort of the, it's, it's like the, the cycle that it, it, it breaks like a, a breaking story that like there was this vicious attack. Um, and, you know, all the people that want to sort of push that narrative, they start talking about it aggressively and all the people mm-hmm. that kind of don't want that to be the narrative sort of don't really say anything. Um, and then later it comes out that there's a video of the incident came out and it's just like the, the initial reports or the way it was being characterized were not accurate based on what you see in the video. So then, you know, it flips and all the people that were talking about it before are real quiet about the video and all the people that weren't saying anything are sort of like, Oh, look at this video. It completely mm-hmm. disproves, mm-hmm. you know, we're, we're so used to seeing this in the, in the news cycle. Um, but I was just sort of, um, like I, I think the um, the narrative that I, I sort of lay out in that uh, the paragraph you read, where I, I think my interpretation is, I think these students are seeing this a lot more as um, it, it's you know, the descendants of European white looking European immigrants are you know bombing all these brown looking you know oppressed is a, like a double oppressed minority. Um, it's brown Muslims in Palestine. I think that's really what's motivating a lot of these progressive mm-hmm. college students, a lot more than this like seething hatred for Jews that um, uh, that were sort of – and like you said, like there are certainly incidents out there. It's not like it's, it's absent from this. And, you know, that's also obviously terrible and strategically um, horrible, uh, you know, for a, a horrible tactic um, to kind of have anything and to allow anybody to say things or have signs. Like if the protesters are smart, they are shutting all that down. Um, but uh, th- this incident, uh, as well as a couple others, are being used to kind of try to uh, instill that other narrative there that this is, yeah, basically like Nazis and it's like 1930s Germany and people calling them pogroms and that they're like, they're just going after Jews and, um, you know, that that's what they've been taught in school. I just don't think that uh, if a fair look at the situation, um, both at what these students have been taught and at how they're acting, um, you know, as a whole here, uh, would, would lead you to that conclusion. And that, that was one incident. There was another one that I brought up where, uh, I think I linked to it, um, where like a woman is like in a park and, um, like calls 911, um, and reports that she's being surrounded and can't escape when there's like so much room behind her. She's walking her dog. And it's just like, it, that is a, uh, that is not a good look um, mm-hmm. for those who are trying to really push, push the, the, the narrative that Jew hatred is central to this movement. And um, as I was sort of saying, as I think we'll get to, uh, I um, agree with a lot of the critics when it's like, hey, you know, we should be defunding um, these schools for the narratives they're they're teaching, but I agree with it because I think that the the narrative, as I laid it out there, is you know ridiculous, um, and I think that trying to push a narrative that isn't really there uh, just hurts that effort. Yeah, yeah. 
just to give specific on that, that one with the flag. So my understanding was at first there were reports going around saying, oh, a vicious attack that I think it was a you know, female student had to get rushed to the hospital because, you know, someone, you know, her guy gouged her eye and da, da, da. And then when the video came out, from my vantage point, what I saw, she's standing there and then there's like, you know, she's like standing on the sidelines as these protesters are marching by and someone's holding up a flag. And I don't even think it was intentional. I think it was just kind of brushing into her. Mm -hmm. And it was like a, you know, people I saw in the comments were like joking. It was like in soccer when someone takes a fall, you know, the the guy just kind of goes by her and it doesn't even hit her eye. As far as I can, it doesn't even hit her eye, but you know, the the guy's waving a little handheld flag and, you know, and and he's going by and, you know, maybe make some incidental and she goes oh he's attacking me did you see that <laughs> and so again I'm, that's not to deny that maybe there are some things going on and i have seen you know the the anti zionist people will say oh i've got plenty of video to show you of zionist protest you know counter protesters coming on and smacking people around we got plenty of video there you're not talking about that so mm-hmm. yeah yeah there's i'm sure on both sides you can go find things you want but like you say counter uh, a lot of these cases that at first get hyped up and then when the thing comes out, then like you say, everybody flips and then they just move on. You know, the people who were touting it before realizing, oh, this isn't a good one. They just move on to something else. And the people who before were like, ooh, did some more people take out somebody's eye? And they're like, oh yeah, see, this is crazy. So the cycle of life continues. (laughs) Okay. Well, what about, are you, have you seen this anti-Semitism bill? I, I've seen right? a little bit about it. I'm familiar with it. I haven't taken a deep dive. Okay, yeah. Yet, so to me, I mean, that's part in terms of like to say, well, what's going to happen with this? Is going to blow it? Like, I, I'm just shocked at the the legs this has, if, if that's the way to put it, that how much like mainstream Republican politicians coming forward. It was really hilarious. There's a lot of people who are um, normally like very anti-woke and totally get how like oh yeah hate hate crime laws are stupid and this is you know if, if somebody commits a crime you punish him for the crime i don't care what's going on in his head and if if he's racist against me unless it comes to if you're anti-semitic and then all of a sudden and so i think it was tim scott you know just recently you know introduced something in in his own tweet or you know maybe an intern wrote it but the, the tweet introducing mm-hmm. it like touts it not as stopping crime or protection of property or something like that or ending violence but to say to root out anti-semitic hate and so i tweeted at him and said why don't you just root out all hate while you're at it and <laughs> i'm you know i'm sure i didn't solve uh, anything by doing that but except to congratulate myself for my wit but anyway so that's what i'm saying like th- this is it's amazing and i'm not the first person to say this but how much the identity politics and then of course anyone who even meekly says, you know, I'm not sure this is a good idea. It gets denounced as an anti-Semite. No, the only possible reason you could be against some government legislation that has feel-good titles in it is that you're, you just hate minorities, in this case, Jews. And, you know, when it's like the same people who can totally see how that's unfair when it's, you know, talking about blacks or women, and it's against, you know, straight white Christian males in U.S. politics. But now on this one issue, the, the tides, in, in, in fairness, the left are a bunch of, many of them are a bunch of hypocrites too, where, you know, they oh, could yeah. totally get it the other way and they'd be dishing it out. But now that they're on the receiving end, all of a sudden, oh, wait a minute, you can't question my motives. How dare you call me a racist? Right. Right. And that's what's so like, that's what's wild about it is like, they're both sides of this issue are terrible. For the same exact reasons, they just happen on this one issue to be reversed. But it's the it's the same thing. It's like it's not the problem is not that like the problem with the left is not that they're against racism and white supremacy. It's that they call all these things racism and white supremacy that are like at the to be. It's like at the very least, it's debatable. Um, often it's just completely ridiculous and like you know, like being like timeliness is white supremacy or something mm-hmm. like that. Like that, that's the issue. It's that you're, you're taking this real thing and trying to expand it so far. And it's like clearly a power grab. And it's the same thing with the anti-Semitism. It's not that those of us who oppose this bill are for anti-Semitism. It's that, um, what, what the, the bill is doing and what a lot of proponents are trying to do in more, you know, not outside of the legislation, just in terms of, you know, the narrative battle is to expand, 
uh, the definition of anti-Semitism to a lot of things that are just clearly ridiculous. And um, so it, it's it's not that it, so yeah, it's not only that they're hypocritical. It's like they're hypocri- hypocritical in the exact same way. It just happens to be on this one issue. They're they're flipped. Yeah. For, by the way, just for for the benefit, I realize we kind of just glided past what what it is, what the issue is. So uh, Tim Scott introduced this bill and it passed the House. And Thomas Massey here is tweeting about it. He says, today the House will vote on a bill, which I guess it passed, to define anti-Semitism with the intent to increase prosecutions of activity on campuses. The bill has a problem beyond violating the First Amendment. The definition of anti-Semitism appears nowhere in the bill. And then, so the the bill itself outsources, like, what do we mean when we talk about anti-Semitism to this outside organization called the, uh, and again, so folks, you understand, it's it's having to do with campus protection, right? So th- this is like the rubric or the, the, the umbrella of the regulations and such, like, how does the federal government have any authority on this? That's the, the, the route they're taking, just like with other protections for minorities, in a, in a college setting, that's, that's how they're doing this. So anyway, there's this organization called the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, and they have a working definition of anti-Semitism. And so the house bill that passed outsources and says, if you want specifics is what do we mean when we say anti-Semitism is not allowed on U S campuses, it outsources it to this. And so this thing gives it, you know, some examples and just to read some of them, um, you know, so some of it's pretty straightforward, like calling for aiding or justifying the killing or harming of Jews in the name of a radical ideology or an extremist view of religion. Yeah, I could see why you'd call that anti-Semitism. And you'd say, yeah, you're not allowed on a college campus. The First Amendment doesn't allow you to call for the killing or harming of Jews in the name yeah, of a radical, so. you know. OK, yeah, exactly. that's so sure. But some of them are, uh, let's see, d- 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 like you can't um, make mendacious or stereotypical allegations about Jews as such, or the power of Jews as a collective, such as the myth of a world Jewish conspiracy or of Jews controlling the media economy. Did it? Okay, so there, I mean, you might think that that's wrong or that's rude or that's a, you know, wrong thing to say or immoral, but like that that should be something punishable by the federal government for you to talk like that. I, like that seems, you know, that's kind of a bit much. Um and then there was one here, too, where people were really getting upset because it has to do using uh, the symbols and images associated with classic anti-Semitism, and then parentheses, example claims of Jews killing Jesus or blood libel to characterize Israel or Israelis. And so there is, folks can imagine, certain people on Twitter were going nuts about that one saying, wait a minute, are, are you saying it's going to be a crime on college campuses now to quote from the Bible? You know, there's passages in the Bible where... Paul and Peter are you know, basically telling the Jewish leaders, hey, you guys killed our Lord. And, you know, what do you, how do you feel about that? <laughs> and so whether you think that's right or not, and whether you think Peter and Paul are anti-Semites, even though they were Jewish, whatever. But the point being, are you saying now that conceivably it could be illegal on a college campus to quote from portions of the New Testament? And people are arguing. So anyway, that's I can't believe that we're already here this fast. And I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, Connor. Yeah, I mean, it's it's crazy. And th- th- there were other examples in there where I think it was about like criticizing the Israeli government um, and, and things of that nature, which was concerning to me because I do that a fair amount in my yeah. articles. But uh, not that I'm on you know, a campus or anything, but uh, I, I have been. So that uh, we're recording this Thursday. That passed yesterday. And um, I have been pretty pleasantly surprised with a, a lot of people on the right that I would have thought would be all on board with this have been coming out in the last, you know, few hours and uh, saying that this is this is not the way um, to to kind of fight back on this mm-hmm. front. And so uh, I, I don't say, know, Connor. Yeah, there were plenty of people that I thought would have just kept their head down. So Matt mm-hmm. Walsh, I'm going to give him props. Yeah, at the Daily Wire, like he was coming out blazing against this stuff you know, for a while. And, you know, that's pretty awkward, I would think, for him with, you know, Ben Shapiro and, <laughs> and everything. So I have to... I, I know, believe give... Ben Shapiro came out against it. Too. Okay, well, good for him. I, I th- okay, I didn't I see think... it one way or the other. Yeah. Okay. But I think he was saying, like, that um, we should defund the universities. We shouldn't, mm-hmm. you know, police speech with civil rights law, which he's right about there. Okay. For sure. Okay, well, we covered a lot of 
bases here. So I guess your takeaway, you maybe alluded to a bit, is that yes, go ahead and let's. Hey, can we all agree that to def- whether you're a Rothbardian ANCAP or a pro IDF Zionist, let's go ahead and defund the college campuses, even though we might disagree on the the reasons for why we're doing that. Yeah, I think that, that's my uh, my conclusion for both sides. I guess is that, and I guess that's the ver- a very Rothbardian um, take is that we shouldn't be forced to pay for it. We shouldn't be forced to pay for mm-hmm. these universities to teach all these things that a lot of Americans abhor, um, mm-hmm. whether it be you know, stories about history or just kind of um, you know, morals, like, like all all aspects of it. Like, okay, they can do that, but we shouldn't be forced uh, to pay. I think that's a very basic like first step. And the same thing um, with the war in Israel. I don't think we should be forced to pay for that. So many, so many Americans uh, want a permanent ceasefire. I think it's a majority now. And mm-hmm. um, so I simply think it's wrong to force them to pay for something that they think is terrible. And so that's my conclusion on both sides. And I wish more sides would be more focused on that. But I guess that's just a, another Rothbardian dreaming. <laughs> okay, yeah, I like that. So you go up to both sides and just like I saw, I don't know if you've seen the video, Connor, where it was, you know, the, the protesters and the counter protest, and then somehow, for whatever reason, one side started chanting, F Joe Biden, yeah. And then the other side started yeah. chanting it back, and they video. both. <laughs> so oh, my man, joke was that. that hey, Biden united the country. <laughs> yeah, but that's another so, thing too. Is I mm-hmm. think uh, on the, for the protesters, I you know I get it started, and if if I'm right about you know that was really the spark mm-hmm. was that what happened on Columbia. But I really wish that they would take this, especially over the summer, they would take this off campus and just like I don't know, go to the White House or something. Like go go where the actual decision makers are, and like mm-hmm. you have so many students out there camped out like you, you could just imagine if they like all went up and like set up on the national mall and every time joe biden had to you know take a helicopter out of there there was just a sprawl of students out there i think that'd be a lot more productive than mm-hmm. um than you know just staying on campus but i i just i, I love that video of <laughs> the two like the, the best of horseshoe theory um the two people who had, had just been screaming at each other agreeing um yeah mm-hmm. the, the the president is a problem to put it uh, mildly. <laughs> okay, so I like that your your conclusion is that you agree with both sides in limited respects that the people who want to stop the U.S. funding the war effort over there or the IDF, you agree with them, and the people who say the U.S. government should stop funding these elite college universities that are filling our students with all kinds of hate and crazy collectivism, you agree with them too. Just, you know, the U.S. government needs to stop spending so much money. Yeah, and stop forcing us to pay for, for mm-hmm. things we might not want to pay for. Okay. Well, there's, I think that's a great conclusion, a great place to wrap. So my guest this, this week, folks, has been Connor O'Keefe. Connor, thanks for your time. Thank you, Bob. And of course, folks, we'll link to Connor's uh, essay at the show notes page here if you want to go read it for yourself. We'll see you next time. Check back next week for a new episode of the Human Action Podcast. In the meantime, you can find more content like this on Mises.org.